Hello and welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. Uh, this time round, it's a car that I actually have rather a big soft spot for. If I had um, the opportunity to have my 30 top classic cars in my collection, one of these would be in the collection. And that's the Mercedes-Benz 450 SEL 6.9. I really don't know where to start with this car because um, I've had quite a lot of experience of them over the years. Uh, I first started working on one in 1986 and uh, it was a local businessman to me who'd had the car from new, uh, bought it in 1978 and uh, his uh, father had a 350SE, the more conventional version of the W116 as it's called and um, they sort of tried me with the 350SE first, I obviously passed muster with that and then I got given the 6.9 to work on. And um, these really were, in their day, uh, a fabulous and very expensive and very esoteric car. Um, in fact, they were an ultimate in certain areas. I can use that expression uh, fairly confidently. Um, and it was a fantastic honour to be given that car to work on in 1986. I was super, super happy about it. And in fact, I carried on looking after it. And several other 6.9s for uh, several years afterwards. That particular car, that first 6.9, um, I ended up buying in, I think, 2001 for £1,500 from the owner because he just didn't know what to do with it. It got to the stage at that time, they were out of favour, they were big, heavy old cars that used fuel like it was going out of fashion. And he bought a, an, at that time, an E320 CDI diesel. And he said, what's the point in having the 6.9? Because the E-Class is just about as fast. I mean, those big uh, six-cylinder Merc diesel um, sort of E-Classes have always been a, a quick car, um, particularly if you breathe on them a bit. And they use a third of the fuel of this. So it sort of drifted out of fashion. But guess what? They're back in big time. It's so funny because this is the most unlikely colour. Uh, this is Milan Brown, which was a very popular colour. They did some wonderful colours in period. Astral Silver was around with Mercedes-Benz for years. Uh, Magnetite Blue, a beautiful electric blue metallic, for want of a better description, a mid-blue metallic. And this colour, brown metallic. And again, this went terribly out of favour in the, uh, the 1990s. Nobody wanted a brown metallic car. Guess what? One in every six cars you see on the road is brown metallic. It's back in and exactly on point. These have sort of come full circle. They've come through the doldrums and enthusiasts are now revering them, as I do. I mean, I, I didn't know what to do with this thing. I think I, think I sold it for £1,600 shortly afterwards or something. And I should, of course, have held on to it. But they're actually going up in value, these cars, quite considerably um, from being a sort of 10 £15,000 car, they're on the way up for good ones. Um, they're very complicated, technically, and if you've ever watched the film Ronin, uh, directed by John Frankenheimer, who was allegedly a very big car guy, you'll know that uh, they actually um, effectively trashed two Milan Brown 6.9s in that film um, that we know of. It may have been more. Uh, and it shows you what, what a popular colour it was when the car was new, that they could find two Milan Brown 6.9s, presumably fairly easily. Great movie if you haven't watched it. They almost get all the engine noises right. Not 100%, the Audi S8 is a V6, which it never was, but otherwise the 6.9 is a 6.9 exhaust note. Really interesting film to see these being put through their paces. It's a, a very interesting car because of the price of the thing alone. Uh, Mercedes-Benz absolutely pushed the boat out with this car. They really did. It's, um, it's got the mighty M100 engine in it, which started life as the 6.3. There, there have only been three models uh, fitted with this engine from Mercedes. The original 600 Grosser, which I'll cover in another video sometime. Um, the, the 300 SEL 6.3, and this is when Mercedes model numbering went completely mental. Um, so you ended up with a 300 SEL 6.3 instead of a 630 SEL, which would have been the logical choice. That car was a sort of hot rod. I've covered that in a video uh, some time ago. If you want to watch it, I go into the details of the injection system on the engine, etc. 
Um, and then Mercedes-Benz had sort of proven the concept. They took a big risk with the 6.3. They sold a lot of them. They realized that there was room for a hot rod super saloon in the Mercedes-Benz range. And of course, it's now become a sort of trim level. A AMG has sort of been diluted very much by Mercedes-Benz, but in the 70s, late 60s and 70s and 80s, an AMG Mercedes was something special. And I would venture to say, this was the closest you could get to an AMG Mercedes at that time, a genuine AMG Mercedes with mechanical upgrades, not just different upholstery. The Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow, I'm just going to have a look here um, to look at prices, to give you some idea of how special this car is. So a Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow in 1977 was 19,662 pounds. A Mercedes-Benz 450 SE, which is the shorter wheelbase version of this, it's, I think it's 100 millimetres shorter rear legroom, was £13,776. And the Mercedes-Benz 450 SEL 6.9 was £22,000 in 1977. That would buy you a country estate, I would venture to say. Um, so, I mean, seriously, mental. Mercedes-Benz knew how to charge at this time. Um, they, that virtually anything on anything less than this was a very expensive extra. Uh, center armrest, passenger's door mirror, um, you name it, metallic paint, alloy wheels, rear headrests, um, almost everything but the steering wheel was an optional extra on them. And Mercedes-Benz made so much money out of the UK market in the 1970s, they secretly called it Treasure Island. And I've heard it reported that they actually made more money in the British market because of the halo effect of the Mercedes-Benz brand that they were turning out sort of, you know, the cheap 200s and 230s. They made so much money that they, I think they actually almost exceeded the profit they made in other parts of the world put together. I don't know how true that is. People can comment on that um, if they know more knowledgeably. But um, very interesting car. It's a 6.8 litre engine. It's actually 6834cc, I think, from memory. So it's not 6.9. I don't know why Mercedes did that. But nevertheless, it was the biggest um, European engine put in a car since the Second World War when it was built. Uh, there was no European car that had whatever it was, 417 cubic inches, I think, something like that it works out at. Um, but it was the biggest engine of any European production car um, going back to 1945 when it was built. So very interesting car, developed uh, big figures for the time, 285 brake horsepower, but the really interesting figure was 405 pounds per foot of torque. That was serious grunt in the 1970s. Um, in fact, I think it was probably unique in having that amount of torque. And it was the fastest four-door saloon in the world when it was built. Um, talking earlier about Ultimates, uh, it was officially recorded as doing 149 miles an hour. Doesn't sound that much now, but in 1977, in a two-ton, five-seater car, that was shifting. The other thing that is uh, special about this car is it's got the hydro-pneumatic self-leveling suspension, which um, works very much on the same principle as the Citroen system, and people have picked me up on the Citroen SM video, the CX video for not getting things quite right or not explaining them because um, I, frankly, I didn't want to be bothered going into great detail, but just to set the record straight so that nobody says, you've got this wrong, you've got that wrong. I'm now going to explain how the hydro pneumatic suspension works. So you've got a height control valve at the front and the back, um, which measure they have a lever system connected to the suspension and they measure the height of the car and either open to admit more um, uh, oil into the system or they close and drain back to the reservoir to lower the car. Um, I'm trying to condense as much as possible here. Each corner has a, a suspension strut which is basically a piston inside a cylinder and you have a sphere assembly attached to that. It's an accumulator with a butyl, a particular type of rubber called butyl diaphragm inside, and the, um, the, the side of the sphere that is not attached to the suspension is filled with nitrogen. 
Um, and that can range anywhere between um, 60 up to um, 100 bar. Um, it it's varies in pressure depending on the application. Um, and nitrogen is more compressible than air. So that, that nitrogen cushion, the fluid passes through a, an orifice, which is, determines how much damping the car has, how much fluid can pass through it, and it then compresses, it pushes against the nitrogen, and that's what gives you your springing. It's a very clever system. Citroen developed it, uh, of course, for the DS in the 1950s, and uh, it works very well. Well, not a lot of people know this, but um, car manufacturers fill their tires with nitrogen when they're new. They do not have air in them. And that's to give them a more compressible, to give you a smoother ride and make them more compressible. So that's why when you buy your new car, the ride is smoother than it is later on in its life. Um, because nitrogen is more compressible than air. It's more friendly to bumps, etc. Um, so this is basically a very good example. It's a right-hand drive car originally. Um, they made only 7,300 of these because of the very prohibitive price. I mean, that's tiny production numbers for Mercedes-Benz or any car manufacturer, uh, any mainstream car manufacturer in the 70s. But um, I'm gonna just talk about one or two aspects of the car which are um, a little more interesting. Um, the engine is, because of this fairly low bonnet line, the engine is actually dry sumped, so the oil reservoir is remote from the engine. Um, it's got a catch, a scavenge pump underneath the engine that pumps the engine into the tank away from the engine. Um, and actually one of the things that can happen on 6.9s is the tank rusts because it's exposed to the elements underneath the front wing. You get stone chips, mud, road salt if you're very unlucky, thrown up there and it really, the oil reservoir doesn't like that. Now, believe it or not, one of the areas I do want to look at is door handles. Uh, it might seem strange, but um, I did slightly talk about Mercedes-Benz uh, cars of this era as door handles in the, in the 107 SL video that I did a while back, which is also, you can find it if you search back on the channel. Door handles were a big deal in the 1970s. Um, because these cars, Rolls Royces, the very rarefied atmosphere at which um, sort of cars were driven and owned at this level, um, it was quite important to doormen at London hotels that they had something good and solid to grip on so they could be in control of how they opened and closed the door as quietly and effortlessly as possible, presumably wearing white gloves, of course, as any respecting, self-respecting doorman does. Um, now this car has got a problem in that the back door doesn't open and the handle sticks, but um, the doorman particularly favoured Rolls-Royce and that's why from uh, the Silver Cloud right the way through to the uh, Silver Seraf, the door handles on Rolls-Royce and Bentley cars were actually a fixed handle with a push button. That was specifically so p doorman at the Dorchester or Claridge's or whatever in London particularly could actually grab hold of a physical handle and push the button and be in complete control of the door. Sounds minutiae-ish, but that's why Rolls-Royce and Bentley did it. Mercedes-Benz didn't do it. They had this, um, okay, it's not altogether cumbersome by any stretch of the imagination. It's very easy to use, but that's, um, Mercedes-Benz didn't do that because they didn't realize how important, such a big deal it was to us Brits, but there you go. Um, this one's got a fault. It doesn't open unless you snap it, which is, hardly up to Mercedes-Benz directives. So we're gonna um, actually take the door handle out and I can just have a little look at that as well. But um, having, having opened the door, there's something else that's um, quite interesting on here. And this is, this is sort of one of the, the strange things about um, cars at this level because um, as my customer with the silver one, as his dad said in the 1980s, these are a, a good engineering job as he put it, and they were. I mean, they were amongst the best engineered cars in the world. Um, but they didn't really know how to do interiors very well. Um, and to give you one example, this door trim, this was very much conceived as a safety thing. And I actually rather like the styling of it. Um, this was done by um, experimental uh, vehicles of which, I mean, Mercedes-Benz had massive resources 
in the late 60s and early 70s. Massive research and development resources. And this, this was a statement for them, this car. Um, it was the absolute top of the range, apart from the 600, which was very, very special order only. But for all that, look at this. What they've actually done is molded some fake stitching into the plastic. This is foam backed plastic. And to make it look luxurious, they've actually, they've actually artificially created stitching in the plastic molding. That's pretty crass on the, one of the most expensive cars money can buy. Um, and it's that sort of thing. I remember working on a, a later version of this, the W126 in the 80s, and it had factory leather in the uh, interior. And none of the ribs on the leather seat aligned with the backrest. It was terribly untidy on such an expensive car. Now, Mercedes-Benz obviously are quick to learn and uh, they did get their act together. And nowadays, because of everything's done on a machine, largely, um, it's all super accurate and perfect. But um, I've always found this, you know, jarring at this sort of level of car that they, uh, they, they can't come up with something more imaginative than that, even just a simple line. Um, but uh, this is a, a great place to be for all that. It's got this uh, velour upholstery, which is quite popular on Mercedes at that time, far grippier than leather. Um, I mean, a leather seat in these, it's, it's a particular kind of slippery leather that Mercedes-Benz used. And uh, you do swim about a bit if you're pressing on in the car. Uh, but this velour is a whole different world. It just, it's really lovely stuff. It's um, quite, uh, you know, unslippy-ish. Uh, so um, anyway, we're going to take this door trim off, we'll take the door handle off, we'll sort this um, door lock problem out and then we'll give the car a drive on the road. Well, this is a, a beautiful, a shining example, if I can use that expression, um, of Mercedes-Benz engineering at the time. This is obsessiveness plus, plus, plus. So we've removed the door handle um, and we found uh, all sorts of things. Uh, this is obviously has never been off. Um, it's coated in grease from 1978. But there's one thing I particularly wanted to show you, and that is this. This is a bob weight here, a counterweight, and it actually gives weightiness. It gives the correct weightiness and precision. You can see the handle sticking because of the aforementioned grease. But you can see that that bob weight um, is actually designed to give more feel and more solidity to the, um, to the door handle as you open and close it. I mean, this is obsessive engineering. This is a door handle, but it shows you the lengths Mercedes-Benz went to in the 1970s to make these cars. Um, and just the intricacy of engineering to give that correct door handle feel. Um, and here is the adjustment. This is actually the, the, uh, the pin that works on the door lock. It pulls it to open the door. And there is an adjustment on this pin um, this is, again, forward thinking. Here we are 40, 44 years later, and we are able to adjust the door handle for the first time. This is its factory setting. And if I undo this, um, you can actually slide that um, along there. And that gives you adjustment as to how the door handle works. Forward thinking or what? So I'm going to put it about there, tighten that up. There we are. Um, we can put that back on the car, lubricate it up to make sure that the spring load, again, it's got a little clock spring here, which on a good day without coagulated 40 year old grease returns that there and we'll pop that back on the car and that should be working beautifully now. German engineering at its best. One finger. Little finger. Perfection. Well, I think there's something absolutely intoxicating. This is uh, just my personal preference um, about a big, luxurious, heavy car 
that also is a bit of a hot rod. It's a sort of Jekyll and Hyde. You can drive it along, driving Miss Daisy, um, and it's very happy. And then you just push your right foot slightly and you tap into very big reserves of power. And this car is, it falls exactly into that category. Um, of course, famously, the Bentley Turbo R uh, in the 1980s um, was, became that car, a Q car. It looks fairly sedate, but uh, boy, does it move when you want it to. And that's one of the joys of this car. Uh, it sort of drives itself almost. Um, you will notice, you may notice on the sound, that the, you can hear the exhaust, which is not standard 6.9 at all. And the exhaust system on this car is a stainless steel uh, one that was uh, fabricated because um, it's very, very difficult or nigh on impossible to get exhausts for classic Mercedes now. And this is actually under silenced, in my opinion, because you, normally you, in a 6.9 you cannot hear the exhaust note and it gets a little boomy. But again, some people, I'm sure, will get comments for and against. Some people love the V8 burble. Um, it makes it slightly more AMG-esque, if you like. Um, but I'm going to, I mean, this road is pretty dry now, so I'm going to knock it down um, into the low gear and we'll just try that acceleration. And this road is almost dry, so... It was actually starting to fishtail there on an almost dry road. Um, I mean, it's seriously grunty, this car. If I just knock it down to second gear. You can actually see the front of the car moving around, even though it's got that high-tech, hydro-pneumatic self-leveling suspension. And this is a two-ton car, so there's a lot of mass moving about here. When you actually push the accelerator down, even though it's got uh, non-lifting uh, geometry on the front suspension, the whole thing just, the whole car just squats and moves under the, the big power. Um, 405 pounds per foot doesn't sound a lot today, but uh, it was in its day, and that's normally aspirated. It's not turbocharged. Um, it's here right from the, the get-go, the word go, that talk. Uh, it makes for a very interesting Jekyll and Hyde situation. As a matter of fact, this was the first ever make and model of car that had electronic anti-lock braking. So we had the, the Jensen FF, which I um, uh, did a while back, which is under restoration. I'll be doing a follow-up video on that. But uh, that had the Dunlop Maxaret anti-lock braking system, which is a, a variation of an aviation braking system, actually. Uh, anti -lock, a mechanical anti-lock system used in the 50s and 60s. But this was the first uh, Bosch electronic ABS system um, ever offered on a production car. This car just preceded it. This is a 60, uh, 78, um, not that old, and um, it, uh, it just preceded having the ABS. I'm just going to knock it down again and we'll just experience that ladlefuls of torque. And because it's non-ABS, uh, Mercedes-Benz were very particular about their brakes in the, uh, all, all the way through. I mean, Mercedes-Benz have always um, certainly been known in, in the time I've been working on cars for having amongst the best brakes in the world on cars. And this feels very confidence-inspiring. Um, it's not ABS, and early ABSs uh, such as were fitted to uh, these, and later Mercs and BMW 6 and 7 series, that, that even though the brakes could be in tip-top form, no air in them or anything, they had a sort of sponginess about the pedal, uh, which this car does not. So the brakes feel very reassuring. Of course, they're potentially not as safe in an accident as the modern ABS system. Um, but uh, I'm just driving along here. Uh, everything's working properly. The car feels as though I could just drive straight to the south of France in one go. Maybe I could take part in a movie around Nice uh, in a, a Milan Brown 6.9. But um, it's just an amazing uh, car to be in. And you can almost sense the extra 40% 
Uh, this dashboard on this car is burr walnut, or burl walnut, as the Americans call it. Um, and the interesting thing about burr walnut is um, it's taken from a very large walnut tree normally, and only about 18 inches of the tree is usable burr grain. The rest of it is grained. Um, I remember somebody at Rolls-Royce telling me that years ago. That's why burr walnut is so expensive. This car has it. The normal 116S class was Zebrano wood. But apart from that, and the hydro pneumatic suspension level lever here, um, and obviously the different rev counter and speedo, this one goes up to 170 miles an hour, uh, it's essentially identical in size to its 40% cheaper 450 SEL sibling. Uh, I mean, a massive premium to pay for uh, the extra performance, but the suspension works ever so well still. In terms of body control, um, keeping stopping the body lurching and wallowing around, but still providing the supple ride, the, the magic carpet ride, it largely succeeds, this car. Uh, I mean, Jaguar were also extremely good chassis engineers around this time, but um, this car is very different from the normal 116S class. They can be quite harsh and quite bumpy. This is not. Um, and again, I keep saying this, this was an ultimate in the 1970s. This was um, one of the most expensive uh, cars, not as expensive as a Rolls-Royce Camargo or a Phantom 6 or a Mercedes 600, but that was about it. Uh, more expensive than a Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow. Uh, and again, you can hear that boominess in the exhaust, which I personally don't like, and I'm going to see if we can dampen that down a bit. Um, but some people, and again, I'm barely touching the throttle there, and the whole car is moving on the road under the power, under the sheer torque. Incredible. Um, the, uh, the grunt that this car has. And it's, it's funny because, um, obviously, these days, 405 brake horsepower is not massive. It's not headline news. But um, it's done with a small engine and a turbocharger as... Um, and I, I'm going to get lambasted by our American cousins for this, but whatever the expression was, Carol Shelby said, that I think there's no replacement for displacement. It's quite different having a near 7-litre uh, fuel-injected overhead cam engine um, available to produce power whenever you want it without turbos spooling up and a modern sort of small engine that develops the torque. There is just no comparison. Uh, it's a world away. And I'm just going to get it on the straight here and um, just open it up just because we can one more time. And I don't know whether you could hear on the engine note there, it was actually spinning the back tyres at one stage. Um, just under the sheer torque of the engine. An incredible car, this. Um, yeah, one of these would definitely be in my personal collection now. Um, possibly even Milan Brown. I'm having fun in this car. Well, that concludes another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop video. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it, and we will be back with something else very soon.